So I'm here today with Reg Hoare, who's one of the managing directors at MHP Communications, who's going to enlighten us on the role of the financial PR. Reg, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Tom. Thanks very much for your time. Pleasure. So can you tell us a little bit about your background and how you ended up doing PR? Sure. So, well, I've had now a 35-year career in the city, oh. would you believe it? Uh, and uh, I spent the first 11 years in an investment bank, or as those days, they were called stockbrokers, which may be a name that's more familiar to people. Um, and that was kind of prior to Big Bang, and I was a salesman. So I, my training sort of was through the firm. I spent some time on the, the old stock exchange floor as a blue button. Uh, I then went into the research department for a bit, but I always thought that sales was the most exciting thing. Um, so my clients were basically institutional investors. Uh, and I learned a huge amount during that period because not only did we have Big Bang uh, in 86, we then had the crash in 87. Uh, I was then at Warburg's for five years during the privatization era which was very exciting doing all those big campaigns, you know, Sid yeah. and all those things. Yeah. Uh, and then things got quite tough over the ERM exit uh, that people may remember, the, mm. the sort of precursor to the, to the, uh, to the Euro. Um, and then things were a bit quiet and I got made redundant. And suddenly I was kind of, you know, I was early 30s and I was thinking, what am I going to do next? Uh, and financial PR was one of those ones sort of vaguely on my horizon as a potential career. And I happened to be fortunate that I bumped into somebody I knew who was a friend of one of my stockbroking friends and he had founded a financial PR company. Um. And that firm was called Ludgate, which just doesn't exist anymore as these things go, things get gobbled up. And he said, oh, you know, if you're looking for a job, why not come and have a chat with me? And I did have a chat. And he then very sensibly said, why don't you spend a couple of weeks with us and see if you like it? And during that time, I really did like it. And I liked the people and the atmosphere. And it was very different from, you know, a big investment bank, as you could imagine. So as one of my clients uh, subsequently said to me, I've turned poacher into gamekeeper as a result of that, uh, that change of career. So what is the role of the financial PR? What do they do? Well, that's, that's a, a, a broad question. Uh, and of course, it varies day to day, client to client. There's quite a lot of variation. But put very simply, there's the kind of strategic sort of overview in terms of uh, how do I communicate? Why am I communicating? Who am I going to communicate to? When am I going to communicate? So it's really advising the client around all those kind of subtleties. Um, and then it's assisting them, obviously, with their requirements to communicate at certain points in the year. So the foundation of the whole PR activity is the financial calendar. Two sets of results, AGM, trading updates, etc., etc. So in practical terms, day to day, what does it mean? What do you do? <laughs> what do I do? So, for example, uh, today I've been working on one or two things. Uh, a couple of them are potential announcements to go out. Uh, it principally in the new year, so a trading update that probably go out to the beginning of January for a client. Uh, and we've just kind of put together a kind of first template before we maybe slot in whether it's good news or bad news. Um, so there's that kind of thing, the sort of, you know, the drafting of the announcements, uh, etc. Uh, then I've also been working on um, some slides for a results presentation, which is going to come out the end of, towards the, the middle to end of January. Uh, and that's a company where there's, um, should we say, there's a new chairman come in and he's given some quite robust views about what he thinks uh, about the messaging uh, that the company has relied on in the past. Um, and so we are responding to that feedback uh, with their in-house people, with their in-house team. Uh, and so I've been working on that this morning uh, with, the, with the client. And do you agree uh, yeah. with his robust um, I think he's got a good point, yes. Um, having said that, of course, the reason why the communications have been like they've been in the past is because clearly companies have to report in a particular way, in particularly in terms of the segments. Mm. You know, that is required under IFRS, mm. you know, that they have to report segmentally. So it's actually quite difficult to, to then say, well, let's turn that on its head mm. and kind of do it completely mm. differently. 
And of course, fundamentally, if, it's, if it is in the first place quite a complex business, as much as you might want to simplify it, it actually is almost impossible to do so mm. if it is by its very nature complex and by its very nature an unusual company. I might be one of only one company that looks like they mm. look like mm. and therefore people, you know, don't, you know, the, the, the shareholder doesn't have anything to compare it with. Mm. And so you have to end up explaining it in, in some detail. So what makes mm. a really good RNS? Well, so I think there's probably two different types of RNS we should think about. One is obviously the results one, and the other one is a kind of a you know a trading update or an acquisition announcement or whatever. And over the years, actually, if you look back five years, ten years, fifteen years, twenty years, they've evolved really quite significantly. Uh, and the best practice now, you know, is very much that we have the highlights page for results, and that we now split those out between financial highlights and operational highlights. And we might even have a couple of highlights for current trading. And then we have the quote. And the quote's a really important thing because that's the kind of the, the takeaway mm. that you want people to, to, to go with. And it's what you also want them to cut and paste into their newspaper articles or their digital blogs or whatever, uh, or indeed into tweets. <laughs> um, so, you know, the, that structure is really important. Um, and also increasingly, uh, I think it's important to, um, in terms of commentary on expectations, to be able to point people towards where they might find an analyst consensus in respect of those ed uh, expectations. So we've been encouraging clients to say, well, actually the consensus is on our website, uh, and increasingly companies are putting the consensus on websites, or maybe just refer to what the consensus is you know, as a footnote in the announcement. And Why then, don't yeah, more companies do that? I think it's one of those things where they've been kind of, they haven't seen the need to do it and they haven't been advised to do it. Uh, and it's becoming something that actually people are requesting uh, and recommending and proposing. And, you do know, you and that's been driven by private investors, actually. You know, and do you advocate yeah. that they should put the figures yeah, that they refer to? Yes, absolutely. And the main reason for that, as much as anything these days, is MIFID, uh, which means that a lot of brokers are only selling their research to a restricted group of clients. And that means if you're not one of their clients, you don't get their research, and therefore you don't, in theory, get access to their forecasts. And so it's becoming more difficult, therefore, to get access to forecasts. And by the same token, there are also now less analysts out there mm. as a result of the consolidation of the market uh, and the difficult trading conditions that investment banks have had over the last five to ten years. Um, and that means with less forecasts, again, less opportunity to, to be able to get hold of them. Um, so if the company collates the forecasts and puts them on its website, hey presto, you have a resolution to, to that issue. You referred to earlier that you mm. were working on a trading update yeah. and you said you'll slot in the appropriate words when they yeah. come in. Yeah. How far in advance do you know that it's good news, bad news, indifferent news? You probably news? get a reasonable feel from the client you know, a few weeks in advance. It slightly depends obviously on the business model because if you're a software company with lots of recurring revenue, you really should be hitting the numbers. Mm. It would take something pretty extraordinary. Mm. You know, if you've got 60, 70, 80% recurring revenue, you know, to miss your numbers. Uh, by the same token, if you're a very seasonal business, uh, it might be quite difficult to see where you're going to end up. And equally, if you're a business that's highly reliant on lumpy one-off contracts, which can fall either mm. side of a period end, again, it might be very difficult indeed. So quite often we might have a conversation with the client which is along the lines of how is it going, and they'll go, well, it's quite harem scarum because mm. we still need to do a number of contracts you know, before the year end or before the half year end to make the numbers. We think we've got them in the bag, but we need the sign bit of paper. So you generally have a steer as to what's going on? Generally have a steer, yes, generally, but, but not necessarily an exact one, but generally. So yeah. with a client with yeah. a nasty profit warning, mm. we're yeah. aware of it at seven o'clock in the morning, yeah. hopefully yeah. if it doesn't mm. come out late. Yeah. What's going on behind the scenes? When are you aware of it? When are you writing it? How close to the wire is it? What's going on Well, the on reality is those sorts of profits warnings actually do tend to all be quite last minute. 
because quite often the company is down to the wire in terms of the business model mm. and whether or not they know the numbers are going to be good, bad or indifferent. Mm. Um, and they might be highly reliant on that one mm. contract or you know whatever it is to come in. And therefore there is a, a rush, a crazy rush, you know, to get something out there. Uh, and that is a process which as, as quickly as you might rush to do it, it still takes quite a bit of time to corral all the advisors uh, to be absolutely certain about the numbers, because quite often mm. the poor old finance director, you know, is actually quite reliant on collating management accounts from various subsidiaries, you know, and there may be value judgments that need to be made about revenue recognition and so on and so forth, most of which is obviously covered by accounting practices, but there may be some, you know, matters of opinion around it. Um, and that just makes it very difficult indeed. So there's quite a lot of, you know, toing and froing basically going on behind the scenes just to kind of nail down. So what's exactly the process what for you? You'll get a call from the company. Yeah, we'll get a You're... call from the company. Uh, and they either will have written something already or they might ask us to write it very quickly. We then will uh, usually have a conference call perhaps with the, with the brokers uh, to get their views on it. Um, usually we then find that the, this draft gets kind of recirculated thereafter with comments, you know, that come in during that meeting or indeed the various parties might go, well, we'll recirculate, recirculate it, then everybody comment again. Uh, and then eventually a point will come where, where usually the, the broker or the nomad, depending on whether it's an AIM company or fully listed, will go, we really need to get this out. So let's, can we try and curtail the commenting and the drafting and actually agree that this is kind of final or near final version? And usually that's the point at which they then seek board approval for the announcement, which obviously is critical that they have to sign that off. Sometimes some of the other board members, quite possibly, you know, in a very serious situation with larger companies, the chairman may well be on the call, a couple of the other non-execs might well be involved. Uh, but inevitably, some non-execs, you know, have other day jobs, uh, other activities that they're involved with, and they can be difficult to track down on occasions. So quite often you'll find that there's a bit of a, you know, bit of time when you're wondering, okay, haven't heard anything from anybody, what's going on? And then obviously the final, final sign off when everything is approved is, is down to the nomad to actually say, right, we're, we're happy for this to go out. And then out it goes. And how long is that timeline? From well, I mean, it, it, you know, typically I would say that takes, you know, two thirds to three quarters of a day. So, so it's know, quite quick. It, it's, it's about it, a day. It, it, in the scheme of things, it's quite quick. Yeah. And do you yeah. get sleep through the night before? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it depends what sort of situation it is. And one's got, you know, over the years, one's got quite used to the... Yeah. Yeah. And what's the biggest challenge as a PR? The biggest challenge as a PR, I think there's two different types of challenge. One is obviously the, the, the client side of things and just the demands around that relationship either in terms of their expectations of what you might be able to achieve, which may not always be realistic uh, in terms of either volume of you know, press coverage or what happens to the share price or whether the analysts are gonna come out negative or positive, you know, whether certain messages are gonna be contained, you know, is all the bad news gonna be you know, included or is all the bad news gonna get, get ignored? So there's always that challenge of, of managing their expectations uh, and there's all, always the challenge with some clients, more than other clients, just around um, just the process uh, of getting things done. You know, there are undoubtedly clients who are more efficient than other clients, and that may be due to the complexity of their business, it may be due to their, their auditors, <laughs> there could be all sorts of variables, but you know, there can be quite a lot of variation around that, which causes us, you know, can cause us issues. And then on the other side of the coin, there's the commercial reality that you know we have a you know we're, we're a successful firm, we've won lots of clients in the last few years. That means our number of clients has gone up per you know consultant, mm. and it, it particularly during the results season, mm. it, it it can be crazy busy trying to juggle you know timetables, diaries, making sure that you know we can we can look after each and every client to the best of our ability. And where do you place the retail investor? There are some PRs that really do not want 
any retail investors at any meetings or any sort of contact at all. And there are others that are more open. What's your view? Well, I've always been very open to it because I'm a retail investor myself uh, and always have been. And therefore, I've always had a kind of strong uh, commitment to including retail investors into, you know, company activities. And the reality is the way the market has evolved in the last, particularly in the last five to 10 years, is that actually retail investors have become a much more important component of a company's shareholder base. Uh, and particularly for smaller companies, and you know, when I say smaller, sort of sub half a billion market cap, they can actually be quite a significant mm -hmm. provider of liquidity and capital you know, to a company, uh, and therefore a really important audience to, uh, for companies to respect. And I think most companies are now beginning to get that message and to understand and realise that actually they need to cater for that type of shareholder. Uh, and obviously, as you know, technology has evolved, you know, for the retail investor, it's much easier to trade uh, on your own account and to trade, you know, in quite significant size, mm. you know, given that we know that there are plenty of ISA millionaires mm who are now out there because of the, the, that tax regime that's mm. been available to us. Obviously, SIPs have made everything much more flexible as well. And again, those are the significant sums of money held in SIPs. Uh, and we can all trade these things on platforms. So I think it's a really important you know, group of people to, uh, to look after. So how mm. do you gear your comm strategy in order to serve the retail investor? Well, generally speaking, we'll advise companies to, one, make themselves more user-friendly, and that can be you know, providing consensus forecasts on their website. That can be commissioning paid for research from somebody like Equity Development or Hardman uh, or Progressive. Uh, equally, it can just be making sure that there are events which those retail investors can come along to, you know, whether that's, uh, you know, one of the equity development forums, whether that's a mellow event or a share sock event, you know, all of those now provide fantastic opportunities you know, for companies to go along and tell their story, you know, to that audience. And the great thing is about that audience is you don't just get, you know, five people turning up or 10 people, you know, you get 50, 60, 70, 80, you know, and potentially more turning up. And they're very engaged. They ask fantastic questions. Actually, sometimes the questions they ask, you know, really put the analysts to shame. So uh, I think companies are realising that, um, you know, they, they need to, you know, to, to look after that audience. And of course, this video. Yes, <laughs> uh, the video. I forgot the video. Absolutely. <laughs> Digital content, very important factor. <laughs> so let's yeah. talk a little bit mm. about regulation. Mm. So there's um, various forms of regulation mm. that a company mm. has to adhere to. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about them? Yes, uh, it's become a minefield for companies. It used to be very lax. Going back to when I started, it really was very lax. Um, and there used to be what was known as selective briefing. So quite often the analysts from the house broker would get a call from a finance director effectively saying, you know, here's a profits warning. Can you downgrade us? You know, put a note out tomorrow morning. And that was kind of how the market operated for years. And the FCA sort of got eventually thought they better do something about this. And so the disclosure and transparency rules kind of evolved out of that. Um, and those are the rules that we now all kind of have to ad adhere to. Um, and essentially what that means is if you've got some news, you've got to announce it to the market and you've got to announce it, first of all, straight away. And secondly, you've got to announce it universally. So you can't have a selective briefing. You've got to stick it out on the RNS system so that everybody gets it at the same time. And preferably that's on your website as well at the same time. So that nobody can claim to have heard about it first. So sometimes yeah. there's mm. a sneaky um, downgrade to brokers' forecasts that hasn't really seemed to be RNS. Would that be? I think that's getting rarer, fortunately. And uh, you're right to be quizzical about it because it is occasionally appears to be kind of on the margin. 
Now, arguably, if it's just a, a refining of forecast by a few percent, by which I mean maybe you know two, three, four percent or something like that, arguably that isn't you know doesn't require a full announcement because it's just the quantum isn't material. And yeah. people wouldn't use a research house as against an actual broker to put something like that out. They shouldn't do uh, if they're being honest with the market. Uh, equally, the analyst may take an industry view, you know, he may have seen comments from other companies in a homogenous sector, and he then might choose to downgrade the peers on the back of the news that's come out of the other company. So a good example might be, you know, obviously retailers or house builders, you know, very homogenous sectors, where the trends that, the, you know, the first one that reports the trend mm. of falling house mm. prices or falling volumes or squeeze margins, you know, the analyst is going to go, well, actually, I'm going to follow suit on all the other companies. Whether they tell me they're doing well or not, I'm going to just cut my forecast. Um, and actually, we had a, there was an example this week of a, a, a client where actually the broker was the top end of the range. Uh, one of the peers, close peers, had had a profits warning. And they decided that was a good opportunity to bring their forecast down to the consensus. So other mm. areas of it, there's more as well. Mm. And can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, more, um, I mean, a lot of this has come out of Europe uh, and it's kind of a, a refining of the regime effectively, which was already in place. But it, 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 it's just put more onus on the companies and their advisors to ensure the level playing field in terms of the release of information, you know, to the markets as and when it becomes known and ensuring that companies do that immediately. So the classic example is the profits warning. Mm. You know, it, this is news, you've got to get it out, you can't wait. That's really what Mars all about, is just that, 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 you know, you have to put this news out. One of the issues had been historically, and where the FCA had done some investigations and fined companies for poor practice, was where they'd known about a potential downgrade, but they'd said, oh, we can wait till the, the results come out, and then we'll do the downgrade then. And the FCA concluded that wasn't appropriate. They shouldn't have waited. The minute they'd known, they should have got the news out there. And was so there it was really tightening up that whole Was issue. there evidence that it, there had been trading as though people had known? No, I think that's the funny thing is, I think in 99% in of cases, there was no evidence anybody traded on it. But it was just the fact that essentially there was knowledge out there, which should have been acted mm. upon. And I think the investors that probably complained to the FCA, which led to the investigations, mm. probably just said, you know, we wanted to know earlier because, mm. you know, we might have done something about it then, not now. Mm. And, you know, it, it's it become the compounding of making it worse mm. by delaying it means that actually it then leads to a worse outcome for shareholders. Mm. And has MIFID II affected you as a PR very much? Uh, it doesn't affect us sort of in, in terms of what we do day to day. Mm. Uh, where it's affected the whole industry is the fact it's putting a further squeeze on brokers' research. Mm. And it essentially has made it, you know, uh, a less profitable activity for them. Mm. Uh, it's uh, made it arguably even more competitive uh, for them. And as a result of which, they are reducing the amount of research that they are publishing mm. in order to make it more commercially viable. Now, that's a disadvantage to companies and it's a disadvantage to investors who aren't receiving that research. And it doesn't make much difference if you're BP, because you're still going to be followed mm. by 20 or 30 analysts. But if you're an unusual one-of-one one type company that doesn't have peers, you know, or you're a small cap, then it's likely to mean that actually you end up with little or no coverage by independent analysts. You're only followed by your house broker. And that's pretty much that. So what's, what it means ultimately is it puts the onus on the companies to pay for research rather than on the investor paying for it, as historically was the regime. And how happy mm. are companies to pay for that research? Well, I think companies are still getting their heads round that that ultimately is, is where it's going to end up. Mm. You know, that's the model which the, the regulator has decided in mm. his wisdom, you know, is the model that should be followed. Um, and they, they view that because they, they believe it to be more transparent in terms of the way the investors are charging their underlying investors for the services that they provide, uh, which effectively, you know, if you were 
a member of a pension fund or you had a life insurance policy or you were a unit holder in a unit trust, you know, effectively you were carrying the cost of that institution mm. buying the research. Mm. That was it. Ultimately, you know, coming, up, coming off the management mm. charge, which was coming off the value of the fund. So the FC said, well, that's not right. You know, the underlying investor shouldn't be paying for that. So the onus is on the companies. The companies are getting their heads around that. And I think they're realizing that's another cost of being listed. And the issue for them, therefore, is, you know, do we have one broker, two brokers? Do we then pay somebody else as well? Do we have commission research? You know, and you can see it begins to tot up financially. Mm -hmm. So it is making the cost of listing higher. Mm -hmm. And of course, the the long-term risk, the law of unintended consequences of this regulation may be that less companies list and remaining a private equity-backed business continues to, uh, should we say, become more and more attractive relative to listing on the stock market mm. when the costs are so high of being on the stock market. So quite mm. a lot of change there. In terms of the PR function, mm. what's changed over the years since you've been doing it? Well, it's changed pretty radically. Mm. And of course, when I started in 95, it was, you know, the infancy of all the communications that we now take for granted. Mm. And, you know, in those days, we really didn't use email, uh, which seems incredible now. Mm. Um, and we used to have to fax out in the morning of results you know, the statements mm. to the press and, and to the analysts. And we'd also, as a backup, we'd courier to them as well. So we'd have, you know, bikes lined up outside the front door to send these things out. And of course, fax machines, if you go back to the early days of fax machines, they didn't have big memories. So you either, they either just sort of went through page by page, or if it did have a sort of early memory in it, you could probably only load up two separate faxes at one time before you used all the memory up. And then, of course, if, the, if they were engaged the other end, <laughs> and you can imagine the newspapers, you know, seven o'clock on a, you know, Tuesday morning in, you know, results season, their fax machine was going to be quite busy the other end. So that being engaged, you'd never get the fax through. Absolute nightmare. Uh, and so the first question that you'd always ask in a press interview for on results mm. day is you'd say to the journalist, have you had the announcement? And in, in most cases, by then, because by then it might have been 11 o'clock, by then they mostly had. However, it was the evening standard that was always the issue, because obviously being a, a, an afternoon newspaper, they had a much earlier deadline. So that was the one where you really had to rely on that courier to get the announcement to them. Yeah, so completely crazy. Mm. So the, the, the PR role, the financial PR role, was as much as about being this kind of postman. Mm. Uh, and, and it was known as post box PR because that was kind of what you were doing. Um, and it was, of course, then very much about the press because we didn't have the internet and, and the wonders of mm. Twitter and, you know, all these other channels to, to consume news. Uh, we didn't have 24 hour news channels you know, with breaking news and so on and so forth. So everybody was entirely reliant on the newspaper mm. for their news. And so newspapers were, were about recording, you know, the previous day's activities. And it was very important, therefore, for companies to get every bit of news that they announced covered in the newspaper. And the good news was, in those days, the newspapers absolutely recognised that. And so pretty much they would cover everything. And you could get some really quite small announcements for small companies, you know, in the FT, even if it was a tiny little announcement. So that was really what it was all about. G going forward 20 years, of course, it's completely changed. And now it's so much more about kind of strategic advice, you know, the, the how to communicate, when to communicate, who to communicate to, how much to communicate, all of those sorts of things, the advisory side of it. And it's much less about the, the, that kind of post-box activity. So now yeah. you've got a proliferation of mm. media channels, yep. which means you have to be an expert in everything from sort of radio mm. to mm. video to mm. TV mm. to newspapers. To, it's got much more complicated. It has got more complicated, absolutely right. And you yeah. spend far more time on lots mm. of different things. Mm. Mm. So how does that work for you, both in terms of skills and in terms of, I suppose you can charge more? 
Uh, yeah, well, hopefully, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, it means we've had to rely maybe more on some of those channels because of the diminution of the other channels. Yeah. So, as the print media has has shrunk, you know, and now there are barely any pages on company news in the newspapers at all, mm. and the only companies they follow are you know BP and mm. whoever. Um, or, or companies that are in major crises, mm. they, they love a crisis. Um, it means we've come to rely more on getting coverage in through other media, mm. you know, whether, as you said, that's broadcast TV, it might be Twitter, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, blogs that are written by people like Paul Scott, yes. uh, you know, uh, and so on and so forth. So that all of that sort of activities become much more important. And Twitter yeah. and things like people's blogs has mm. made the retail investor far more powerful in a way. It has, it has absolutely, because it's given the retail investor access to a much kind of wider pool of information than, you know, one had in the past. Mm. And, you know, if I go back to when I started training as a stockbroker, actually, I spent three months in our private client department. Uh, as it was known in those days, wealth management, as they'd now rather grandly call it. Mm. And that was literally, you know, there would be stockbrokers kind of ringing up their clients to say, oh, today we're recommending buying United Biscuits. And there's always the joke about the person the other end of the phone uh, replying, oh, what do they do? <laughs> um, uh, which kind of was fairly obvious. Yeah. Um, so that was kind of the world in those days. And of course, nowadays, it's much easier for people to get that information. So when we say, why don't you have a look at X, Y, Z, we can quickly Google it yeah. and hey, presto, we may yeah. find that Paul Scott's written about yeah. it and there might be a whole stream yeah. of consciousness on Twitter from mm. Conkers tagging me on 46 tweets on Burford, <laughs> which I sold at two quid, having made a profit. <laughs> so anyway. So you yeah. are a private investor yourself. Yes. What are the constraints as a PR in your own investing? Well, you'll be pleased to hear that we have a compliance regime uh, and we're not allowed to trade shares in our clients, to put it very simply. Uh, and is that yeah. true for most PRs? I think it's true for most PRs. I mean, I'm, it certainly was true for the firms that I used to work for in the past. The only exception to that is if you already held the shares, then there is not an expectation that you would have to sell them unless the company, having disclosed that to them, uh, said, oh, no, we'd rather you did sell them because we see that as a conflict of interest. In reality, in my experience, while I have held shares, actually the company said, great, that's great that you do. Sorry you won't be able to trade them anymore, but that's fine. So that's kind of the regime that we're under. And of course it does mean that now and again there are things that you'd like to buy, which you're not able to, which is very frustrating. Probably on some occasions that saves you some money as well. <laughs> um, but equally it means that there are, um, you know, uh, you could, for example, look at your favorite investment trust and actually go, well, I might buy that because they've got a big holding in that client which I think is very good. And of course, that is not restricted because clearly the investment trust, you know, isn't the company, as it were. So there isn't that similar compliance issue. But what do you feel mm. if you hold a company that mm. is a client and you then can't trade it? Isn't that a little bit yeah. challenging? Yeah, that's very challenging. You know, very, if you, you really know have to grip bad information's teeth. coming out. You then... really have to grip your teeth. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Have you been in that position? Yes, I have. Yeah, yeah. Not Fortunately, not too many times. Um, and I've also been in situations where I've ended up holding a share for a very long time just because it, it, it you know, the, the share price has just, you know, maybe had a bad time and then taken a long time to recover. And it's been a client of mine for a very long time. So the one good example of that is Begbie's trainer that had results out earlier this week, yes. which has been a client of mine since, I think I'm right in saying about 2007 or 2008. And I bought shares in it about six months before it became a client because uh -uh. I saw the opportunity. And it's, if you look at the share price chart over that longer period of time, it's not been a great performance. It's done very well in the last three or four years, but I actually held that throughout that whole period. But that's where, of course, the dividends become yeah. important as part of your total return. So if you weren't a financial mm. PR, what would you do? Well, I suspect I'd probably still be, uh, you know, in the investment banking world. Uh, assuming they hadn't got rid of me, you know, maybe redundant, retired me early or something like that. But I suspect if that happenstance of, 
you know, having bumped into this old contact and he said, you know, come and have a chat and have a think about it. And then I had that option of choosing fortuitously between a job offer to go back into stockbroking or move to financial PR. You know, if I hadn't had that, I probably would have taken that that job back in stockbroking and I'd still be stockbroking in one And if you had that weekend back again, which would you choose? I think I'd, st- without doubt, still choose the financial PR. I think I might have been a bit cannier about the about the money. <laughs> <laughs> I slightly rolled over a bit too easily. <laughs> Reg, thank you very much indeed. Pleasure.